We know that domestic violence doesn't discriminate, so we know that um, domestic violence is perpetrated by women and experienced by men. We know that domestic violence happens within same-sex relationships, but we do know that overwhelmingly domestic violence is perpetrated by men and experienced by women. The cost of violence against women is estimated to be £23 billion a year. £23 billion every year in the United Kingdom. If you think about the extent of domestic abuse in this country, more than one in four women, that's a quarter of the women in this country are experiencing domestic abuse, is that a quarter of the children in this country as well? The common feature with all these men was their belief system. They all believed that being male gave them the privilege to be in charge in the relationship, to assume that the woman would do as he says. We should have the same level of response to domestic violence that we have towards child abuse. It's very similar in its impacts, in its effects on mental health and well-being in society, in its prevalence. We should have that level of response. People are outraged by child abuse. It accounts for 25% of violent crime and that's what we should be working towards is having absolute outrage at a societal level. as an organisation um, at Equation believe that relationships should be equal, they should be about equality. In a domestic abuse situation, the person who's being abusive believes in the relationship context, they have a right to have power and control. So they will do anything to gain that level of power and control. And it could be different things within different relationships. Different relationships might need di um, different forms of abuse um, to enable that person to gain that level of control. Physical abuse could be anything. Again, we often assume that when we're thinking about domestic violence, physical abuse is the first thing that we think about. Um, and we often maybe imagine a, um, a bruised face, a bruised eye, and so we maybe assume that domestic abuse is about being punched or it could be about being kicked. Whereas actually even the, con even the um, definition of physical abuse, um, there are so many things that can come under that. So it could be being burnt with a cigarette, it could be being drowned in the bath, it could be being forced to drink bleach, it could be having your, um, you know, their hair cut. So there's all different forms of um, physical abuse that fall under that definition. So it isn't just as simple as, um, you know, as we maybe first think. And then in terms of financial abuse, financial abuse is often one that we, um, we don't necessarily consider to be um, a form of abuse. The survivor is only given a maybe a small allowance to buy certain items that they need to provide receipts for everything they've got that they don't have the survivor doesn't have any choice about um, the, the, the products they buy or the things that they buy. They might not be allowed to buy certain products, they might not be allowed to buy um, feminine hygiene products, they might not be allowed to buy new clothes themselves. Um, the um, abusive person may never buy the um, survivor gifts. Um, so it's all, all the, um, another form of financial abuse might be that the, um, all the bills, um, all the um, cards could be in the abuser's name and therefore has got full control over them. Or alternatively, they could all be in the survivor's name and therefore debts are, when debts are um, run up, um, it's the survivor who is in, um, in, in debt. In terms of emotional abuse, again, there's a whole gamut of issues that fall under, uh, under emotional abuse, and this can, this can range from um, a, a perpetrator um, isolating their, um, 
their partner from their family and friends, by telling lies about them, by making up things um, that maybe seem like treats but, but are actually um, ruses to get them away from their family and friends. Simple things like criticising what they're wearing so that they don't want to go out, and um, putting them down, telling them um, that they, you know, that they they will never find anybody other than them. All of these sort of maybe um, things that seem quite small um, are things that just slowly um, pick away at the survivor and slowly um, reduce their self-confidence and self-esteem. Falling into an abusive relationship is that everything's quick, so everything's fast track. So it's kind of whirlwind off your feet, next minute you settle down into marriage, family, whatever. So, um, and looking back, I think there were slight signs, um, but nothing that I would have identified as being a massive issue. It started out with um, quite charming and gentlemanly, etc. Um, so it was all good, you know, like cared for and understood, appreciated, etc. Um, and then. Um, then I kind of moved in with this person and that's when the controlling really started. And the best way for me to describe it would be like dripping, you know, every as the relationship progressed it got a bit more so. I met him on the first day I got to uni in Southampton and he just stayed in my, in my room in halls. Well, for a year after that, like he didn't go back to, and he was in a lot of trouble with his landlady and things. Yeah, it was really good at first, um, and you know, um, in love, and um, first few months was fine, and then I got caught pregnant. But things had started to go wrong in the sense that he was um, out all night, and I was just starting to think mm, things aren't as good as I initially thought. But even right from the beginning, it was never ever equal. Um, I, he, he was always the one that, it, it felt as if I was trying to get somebody that I never was going to get because he was a lad about town, he had a reputation and I think I thought he was better than me and when I started seeing him I thought, right, he was good looking and he had money and all those kind of trappings that a young girl can kind of fall for if she's sort of looking for something. There's, there's no shortage of I want you there's no shortage of that it's full on and I guess if you respond to that and there's a need for that and a vulnerability to that it just sucks you in so it's consuming it takes over your whole life there's there's not much room for anything outside of that and at such an impressionable and young age that's what I wanted he was always of the opinion that he knew better because he was older and you know when I met him, I still lived with my parents, even though I had an independent life, you know, I worked and I socialised, etc. I was confused because it was like our money was shared. He assumed we were shared and so I just assumed this is what a couple was and we, and, you know, paid for his food and things. And because, because it was sort of like it was my fault in the sense of he'd come to live with me, for me. So in the first month, I couldn't pay my accommodation fees and I'd get into trouble and so like I'd get I'd get phone calls and things saying that I, I was in debt and stuff and so I'd start crying and and he'd be like looking after me. During the pregnancy um, that's when things just went from bad to worse, just hell. I was still working at the time, he wasn't working and um, obviously I was getting bigger, tired, uh, mood changes. My partner at the time it was um, just getting more jealous, more controlling. Um, if I wasn't at work, wanted to know where I was, um, didn't believe where I was. We'd been together sort of on and off and then I got pregnant. So obviously that, then that was a definite change. I was the one that was at home all the time and he'd just go out and do carry on doing, you know, living the life, going out, using work as an excuse. I would be just at home looking after everything and he'd just waltz in when he wanted and waltz back out. And that's that kind of, you know, there wasn't any physical violence even up to that point. It was pretty much just the fact 
of I was just stuck at home all the time and never knew when he was going to come home, never knew when he was going to go out, never to ask any questions, never to put any pressure, never to ask any anything from him. He'd give me emotionally and, you know, on all of that, he'd give what he wanted to give and that was it. The biggest changes came when um, marriage wasn't enough for me. As a woman, it wasn't enough. So I didn't want to fall into that trap of, you know, sort of wife looking after someone, um, mother, whatever that is. I wanted an education and I wanted to pick up where I'd left off and I wanted to do other things and have friends and be me as well as somebody's wife. And that's when it started to um, turn, very gradual and increase over time. Further into the relationship, it, it was, um, I mean, the most ridiculous one was um, which side the handle on the mop bucket should be, because you've got the pouring side and the non-pouring side, and he was very insistent that it should be on the non-pouring side, which, you know, again, makes sense, it's logical, but I'm the one mopping, <laughs> you know. Um, I mean, I, I can laugh about it, um, but being in it, it's like, what's the issue? Why, you know, I don't understand why it's such an issue. It made a big issue of absolutely everything. Everything became an issue. So we'd question why I'd wanted to do it and um, why are you not happy here? So it was almost like a lack of understanding. Am I not providing enough? You know, are you not happy? Do you want to leave? The whole thing was so distorted. So if you think about a healthy relationship, someone would say, yeah, that's great, go and do it. Well, I'll give you my support on that or discuss it and talk about it. There was none of that. So it became very conflictual to actually do anything. So in time, it wears you out. It takes your energy. So it's so easier to just say, OK, I shan't bother. But then you're instantly into pleasing somebody. So I instantly slipped into subordination for my own sort of peace and, and safety. Um, but it doesn't serve you because it, then there's another issue presented. So then it's, well, you know, how long did it take you to go shopping? Where was you? Why did you nip to your friends on the way back? So you think by stopping doing one thing or birth peace, but it doesn't because there's something else that is created to take away a bit more and a bit more. So you're in the cycle of it. From the first few months, it just got worse and worse and worse because I had less and less money and lost a lot of weight. It was, can I have some money for this, can I have some money for that? Can we, like, shall we get, well, it was, shall we get some, shall we get that? Do we need to get this and things like that? And, and so I was, I was instantly in, I like, didn't have enough money for food and things like that, so like, that's what my parents mainly noticed when I came back at Christmas. I'd lost, I think, two stone. Like. I left work. I worked right up until like the last moment, just because I didn't want to be at home. Um, I was, you know, supporting myself. I was going to all, all the appointments and stuff, everything on my own, although we were still together. Um, and he was just getting more and more into like a load of drugs. Um, he was out partying, so. He'd be out all night and come in at about, you know, six, seven in the morning and it, just bring a load of mates. And, you know, by this point, I was really heavily pregnant and it just wasn't an ideal situation. He was always the one in charge. Um, he was totally self-centred and selfish and everything else. The, the, like, going off for two days and I wouldn't know where he was and he wouldn't answer his phone and, you know, and things like that. So that kind of, I think, was the beginning of it. There was nothing physical because I think that kind of living with that broke me down and down and down. And I didn't have any friends because I was like 21 when I had my daughter. So my friends were all still single, young, free and single and stuff. So I'd got nobody around me. Now I look back, I was completely reliant on him for everything really. And the fact that he, he didn't treat me with any respect, my self-respect went down and down and down. I went out for um, 
to see my friend and I got back at 11 o'clock or so um, and yeah I got in cold shoulder treatment so I was like I'm going to bed uh, no you're not that's a matrimonial bed and, and you've kind of been adultery to me kind <laughs> of you know way dramatic and out of proportion again um, so anyway I, I got into bed he came into the room he pulled the covers off he said get out of the bed I said no I'm going to bed I have to be up for the children he then dragged me out of the bed which I got back in he dragged me out again and then I don't really recall exactly but a fun moment was he I think he was trying to push me off the bed and I had my feet and my arms on the wardrobe at the end of the bed like no <laughs> and the whole wardrobe just caved in <laughs> and like I say I can laugh about it now um I think because I'm, I'm a strong person and I'm glad to be out of that situation. Um, but yeah, and I had this big bruise on my hip um, and a few grab marks, obviously. It was constant criticism. Constant, or oh, I'd been out too long, I'd shopped too long, I'd not made the money go far enough. You know, at this point I weren't working, so it completely got me financially as well. So my independence was nil. So I was at the mercy of every word and every whim. It escalated onto physical violence, yeah. Can you, can you tell us about that? You need to stop a bit, yeah. I thought I had depression and I was very depressed and things. I mean, I think I was, but I mean, I thought it was all in me because all this debt stuff, I managed to say it was because of the debt, but the debt was because of him. But at the time, I just thought, I'm really depressed. And the more depressed I got, the more it was like he was my support and looking after me. Oh. So I was getting weaker and weaker. And I was just scared of, scared of life, really, because he made everyone, everything is, was trying to get us, like, you know, yeah. phone companies and rent and stuff. It meant I was too scared to... Like I don't, don't, I still today I don't like using phones because I get very scared of people ringing asking for money or saying that I've done something wrong or like, yeah. um, and and so I started not going out very much because I was too scared oh to see, it, you know, like the whole world started to scare me a bit, a lot really. That aggression then turned to physical violence on me, which. Um, Hmm. is extremely damaging and at that point it's very hard to keep your family safe because they hear it and they see it. I was bathing the baby and I thought it was somebody out, I thought it was a friend who'd come round and um, open the bathroom door and his dad just immediately started to strangle me. I remember my feet being off the floor and the baby being on the floor and um, took me outside in the, in the back garden and um, thumped me so hard. I remember my chest just cracking and him just saying, you know, if I can't have you, then nobody can. And he had a knife and I, and I thought, this is the end of it. This is gonna be it. I could feel the knife going in before it had gone in. I remember my elbows getting soaked from the earth on the grass and it all coming up through my elbows. I could hear the baby crying on the bed in, in the room, in the house. And then his dad had a piss at the side of me. And it, that was so humiliating, just that image. He got me out of bed and he made me come downstairs and for three, four hours, verbally attacked me and pulled me to pieces. And every time I would just stand up to go and he'd make me sit back down again. And um, that, as I say, that went on for sort of three, four hours. I was completely exhausted. And I just kept thinking, I wish he'd just hit me just so then it'd be over with because one hit or something it's just over in seconds and this is just dragging out for hours, you know, so, yeah. He was actually taking my card. I could see, I had online banking and I could see and like, it would match up with the times that he got, it was so obvious. 
because this was the problem as well. He knew my pin because I was so depressed. One day he, he took me down to the water and sort of, and, said, and admitted. I think it was when he'd spent this deposit money. There were a few deposit monies in the years. Um, and he was so upset because this is it. He'd get very, very upset when something did hit hit the fan. You know, he'd he'd um, and he like started crying and say, I've done, I've done this. You know, I spent all the money. If it had started in the middle of the night, I'd go downstairs and think, okay, if if there's going to be physical abuse, let's do, might as well be downstairs than upstairs because your children are asleep. Um, and it all becomes very, very painful, very painful. And what goes very much unseen is what that does to a person. What was unseen for me is what it takes away in terms of how you think and how you feel about yourself. And the pain is so painful, you can't acknowledge that. It's so hard to acknowledge what was in and what was happening. So in terms of the outside world, you put on a front. So we'd go out together, we'd go to family for tea, and they'd think, oh great, you know, family unit. But what was going off behind the scenes was completely different, was horrific. I never had any time away, you know. Um, I'm a dedicated mum. Um, not perfect, obviously, but, you know, I'm there for my children and I'm dedicated to them. And I was just asking for one afternoon a week so I could go cycling or walking, which are probably the two hobbies I have. Um, and he was like, no, no, we're combined units, you know, we're all one, we're melded one unity and you don't get to do things that you want to do now. Women and girls when they're young are given this like unsaid type of responsibility that they are, have to be caring and giving and loving and all of those kind of things that we think that women and girls and should be. He told me that this happened to him in his childhood or this happened to him in previous relationships. He's had women that have treated him badly you know, you get all the, you can get those kind of stories and then you take it on board and you can kind of sit there and you think, well, that, you kind of make an excuses for that person. And then you think, well, if I, if I stick around and, and I'll make it all okay. He says he's sorry that he hit me yesterday and, and I, and I believe that he is sorry and it's because he's got all this emotional baggage and everything and it'll be okay, you know, one day he'll come out of this and he'll realise that I've put up with all of this because I love him so much. And then when you've got children, you want to keep the family together and you're thinking that you're doing the right thing. I want to go, you know. I just stuff this staying together for the children, it's for my children. I don't want my son to grow up thinking that's how you treat women and I don't want my daughter to grow up thinking that's how you are treated. Um, this isn't right and if I'm going to stay together for the children that's going to be at least till they're 16 and I won't, I'll, I'll just crumble and I'll wither as a person spiritually. Um, I'll, I'll just be an empty shell of skin and <laughs> you know hair, eyes. Um, which is when I then went to the solicitor to seek advice where I stood. You know, I went to citizen advice and, you know, I, I went to a lot of places and, and gathered as much information as I could and um, left. If you talk to people, you get an understanding of what's right and what's wrong by people's reactions. And the more I spoke to friends, the more I, it was more like, oh, this isn't right, this is wrong. So actually that's the best thing don't keep anything hidden if you're keeping anything hidden then you know it's not good you think that you're keeping it away and you think that you're keeping it sort of under wraps and um, that nobody else knows and things um, but I'm not too sure really if that would ever be possible even to the point of if, if even if I know that my daughter didn't ever see him when she was smaller, you know, she didn't see him or anything, but she must have heard the arguments and, and things like that. Um, but it's just living with that environment. It's just living with that unsaid tension in the house. It's living with a mum 
that has no energy, no sort of no life about them. That it, a person that is living, just living day to day, you know, not knowing what that day is going to bring, cannot possibly function properly. Even if you think you're functioning at the time, you can't. You don't. You don't live a life, and therefore your children don't live a life. I mean, they go to school and they've got friends and things, but it's it can't not affect your children. When children are living with domestic abuse, providing they actually get born safely and healthily, because there are miscarriages due to injury, they can lose their mother at any time because more than two women are killed by their partner or ex-partner in this country every week. They are all emotionally abused, which is covered in a, a recent report by CADA, who are a campaign group to do with domestic abuse. They talked to 877 children, 62% of whom are directly harmed as a result of living with domestic abuse, whether that be um, getting injured, trying to protect mum, or by other means. So that's quite a startling new figure. If we take just an example of a child who is laying awake at night, can't sleep because it can hear shouting going on in another room, that child is at least A, stressed, B, unable to sleep. So it's invariably tired at school, if it's a school age. Um, Maybe bedwetting might restart. Um, it can't concentrate at school because it's going to be tired, it's going to be distracted, confused, distressed. So then we start on the cycle of schoolwork suffering and maybe getting bullied because they're not doing very well at school. Maybe truanting, then if they're older, getting into substance misuse, alcohol abuse. One third of children interviewed by CADA had mental health issues or substance misuse issues or a combination of both. 60% of children involved felt to blame for the domestic abuse, but 52% had behavioural problems. So I think there's a role for people working with children with behavioural problems to look beyond the problems and think what might be causing those problems. There's a Canadian study that links ADHD to domestic abuse and found that many children in Canada had ended up on Ritalin when actually they didn't have ADHD at all. It was caused by almost like a post-traumatic stress disorder. If you think about the extent of domestic abuse in this country, more than one in four women, that's a quarter of the women in this country are experiencing domestic abuse. Is that a quarter of the children in this country as well? So if a quarter of them are going on to exhibit abusive behaviour, it's, it's a really serious situation if it's not getting tackled and those children aren't getting the help that they need. I think now with the, the wider understanding of domestic abuse, um, people are aware that this is more than assaults. This is about a pattern of behaviour. It's around a, a way of living where people feel under control. One of my roles is the lead strategic officer for domestic violence and domestic abuse. Stalking and harassment, female genital mutilation and child abuse. So a lot of those factors link in with domestic abuse. Domestic violence is an appalling crime. It's completely unacceptable. I was worried that the police weren't handling domestic violence cases properly. That's why I commissioned this report. Sadly, the report shows that I was right. It shows significant failings in the way police deal with domestic violence, um, not having the right attitude towards victims, lack of clear leadership on this issue. The police, historically, when we do training, it's around this is what this type of offence is this is what you need to do in order to gather the evidence and this is what form you need to fill in and I'm talking generally here because there are some very very switched on officers who actually understand this and get this and there are those that don't get it. Sadly what I see when I read this report is uh, examples of women saying for example that the way the police had dealt with a case when they came to uh, see when a report had been made that sadly when the door was shut and the policeman went away often it became worse, the issue became worse. The majority of the time they're dealing with the reports of burglary or car theft, where actually when victims ring up, they want us to turn up and they want us to fill a form in and they are offering information very readily. Yet when they're dealing with domestic abuse, um, quite often they're dealing with a victim in turmoil who actually doesn't know what they want at that time. 
and may appear um, to the officer as if they're not cooperating or they're not being helpful and they're not giving you the right information. And, and I think this is where this sort of um, attitude has come from, where officers would say, oh, what's the point? Because she will always retract or she'll make a complaint and then next week she'll ring in and, and retract it. And I think that's where we've tried now to sort of accept that it's not about filling forms in or putting things onto computer. It's actually getting into the minds of officers to understand the psychology of why victims behave as they do. We know that very, very high percentage of women who in endure and suffer uh, domestic violence are likely to go on to develop post-traumatic stress disorder, a range of mental health problems, depression, anxiety, often coming together, so PTSD, post-traumatic stress and depression, um, because of the repeated um, traumatic impact of being emotionally, physically, sexually abused. Again, I compare it directly to child abuse. Um, the reason why child abuse is even, can be even more harmful in some ways is because it's a developing brain. Domestic violence goes on for even longer. Um, so a woman may be repeatedly traumatized, which has huge impact on the brain at a biological level. So there's our neurochemical stress systems which respond to stress. If they're repeatedly exposed to chronic stress, which is what is happening, you get an absolute shift in the, neuro the neurochemical systems which help you endure stress, which has both physical and psychological impacts. In terms of your thinking skills, you can't, your memory is affected, your concentration is affected, your ability to reason out different ideas, problem solve is affected. We know this scientifically. It affects your ability to think and it affects you emotionally. And so already your ability to think through the situation and how to get yourself out of it is hugely impacted. And I think people who criticise the, the survivor also fail to think about, the, um, like I said before, the complexity surrounding that, that survivor. So they don't necessarily think about all the barriers that are stopping that young woman or the, the woman leaving that relationship. So it, it isn't just as simple as, um, I've been hit, I'm, that's not on, I'm going to leave. It's thinking about, well, where will I leave, um, you know, where will I move to? This is my house. It's thinking about the history that's in that relationship. It's thinking about, well, maybe if they've got children together, I don't necessarily want to be a single mum or I don't want to have to take the children away from the father or it's thinking about finances maybe the woman's not been allowed to have a job so therefore doesn't have any income so therefore how can she possibly financially leave she might not know about support services she might not know that there is an alternative place for her to go to so if you're thinking that if all that is happening um, and this woman is at her lowest point low self-esteem low confidence and she's being asked to make the biggest decision of her life she's being asked to make the decision to take her children potentially if she's got children away and leave the area with all her friends in with all her family in she's being asked to do that at a point where she's feeling feeling low it's a massive ask that I don't think people are um, fully appreciative of when they're making comments about the woman needs to take responsibility she needs to leave the relationship and I think um, what we really need to focus on is rather than thinking about why doesn't she leave really think about why is he doing it and what can we do to stop him from doing it I genuinely think that for um, a lot of men, and I, I'll include my, myself in this, uh, domestic violence is not something that um, they've given a lot of thought to, that um, what thought they have given to it tends to be just associated with the violence part of, of domestic violence, um, which people understand. But um, what people don't understand is that the violence is, is generally um, the result of patterns of emotional be be, uh, abuse and controlling behaviour over a long um, period before. I, I'd like to talk about where the um, standard male belief system comes from, but I think you have to go back for years and years of, of cultured training. I mean, some say, oh, it was my family, and that, that's important because people do le learn things from um, the way their families behaved in the past. Other people say, oh, it was religion that made me behave like this. Oh, it was uh, my granddad used to behave like that. But there's no excuse. You just need to have uh, respectful relationships 
and, and you have the right to choose how you relate yourself. You have to take responsibility for the way you behave. Most men in the UK are living in a context in which there's a, a definite power imbalance between men and women, uh, historically and still. There's definite attitudes towards men and women and genders and what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman and what it means to be in a relationship. And each man is located within that cultural and political context. Domestic violence, yeah, it's, it's like it works both ways. It's like if you're a woman, you're in a relationship, if you're in a relationship, yeah, if obviously if a girl's gonna act up and go on in a way with man and she's big enough to throw bangs at man, <laughs> she's big enough to take one, isn't it? Violence uh, is such widespread now, uh, it's so easily accessible, like to see it and hear about it, it just happens. I mean, I'm not like blaming games, I'm not blaming anything like that, but people these days need more to get a thrill out of things. I think it's because the, the, the women, they like, they like cheating on the boyfriends and stuff, and then when they go home, they, like, uh, and the boyfriend asks them how long, you, what, what you're going out for and stuff, but they don't really care, they like living two, two lives, isn't it? I think what, what is most, most say, domestic yeah, violence occurs the like, from the female. Obviously, you know when I mean? say domestic violence, it's because a man's hitting a woman, yeah, obviously, yeah. because no one complains about a woman hitting a man, but they do, they do pile it on, they do try and niggle at you and they Escalated. try and get, not saying that we do it or anything, but I've seen how they go on and it's, it is two ways. So there's a culture of it happening in the background and you hear about it, but you never think it will happen. And then if you actually find somebody who's had it, half the time they don't understand how to stop it or they don't know. So I think it's just a culture of people not knowing how to deal with it and not knowing how to deal with their own issues. I think it's something that does need to be widely expressed, definitely does, but it's also something that not many people want to talk about and not many people want to hear about it. I think when I first got involved in the domestic violence sector, I, like most other people, um, if asked what, why, why are men violent against women, um, would have come up with things about um, their self-esteem or their use of alcohol or how they manage their anger. Although I could see from a very young age that there are these gender inequalities and that men and boys had privilege that um, was denied women and girls and, uh, and saw how men got away with things. I didn't really make that connection to the, their violence was because of their beliefs about women. But when I got involved in the sector and got the training and it just clicked, uh, and when I started working with men, I was working with men who uh, from very different ethnicity very different backgrounds, very different childhoods, very different work life, very different um, class systems, um, you know, economic circumstances. All that was very different, but the common feature with all these men was their belief system. They all believed that being male gave them the privilege to be in charge in the relationship, to assume that the woman will do as he says to assume that his decision is final. His needs came first. You know, he was the boss, she was his possession. And likewise, so were the children. And when you think about it, that's how kind of societies have been set up for many years, isn't it? You know, that um, before women in the UK got the right to vote, they were legally seen as a possession of men everything, all this gender inequality is happening around us at all times and that could be, for example, it might be the fact that um, the majority of MPs are, um, are men, it might be the fact that the laws were mainly written by men for men and it's only, um, you know, only recently that they're, that they're being rewritten to reflect the needs of um, women. For example, it wasn't until 1991 that um, rape within marriage became illegal. Um, so there's lots of different areas of society, politics, law, education, employment, sports, music, all these sorts of areas have um, um, areas of um, male superiority and female inferiority um, within them and all they do is they perpetuate um, the belief that um, abusive men have that what they're doing is right and that having a, um, power and control over women is justified. If we think about sport as a structure in society, the vast majority of sports that we see on the media are male sports and all the kind of promotion and finance is you know, directed at male sports. 
Uh, we have sportsmen who are violent against women but are still seen as great men. So the message that you can be violent against women and still be great is, is striking and it's there. Um, so it doesn't stop young boys aspiring to be those sportsmen who are also being violent against women and girls. There is a place for all these structures to turn things around. That's what it's going to need. Some positive direction towards a gender respect, respecting and valuing women rather than degrading, devaluing. But also children's toys um, have a big influence. You know, children from very early ages are working out their identity, their gender identity. Much of this can come from the products that are being aimed at them. And young men are really being um, encouraged to be thinking about the importance of strength, the importance of being um, a man, the importance of uh, masculinity and power and having control and having taking responsibility and taking charge. In complete contrast to that, young women are getting messages around the importance of um, their sexuality, the importance of them looking a certain way, being a certain size, the importance of their looks in order to be successful. So both young men and young women are um, being encouraged by messages that they get from the media to think about what they have to offer in a, in a physical way towards relationships rather than helping them to think about um, what they can offer the world themselves, their friendships in terms of who they are and who they want to be. It's like a goldfish in a bowl of water. The goldfish wouldn't necessarily be able to talk about the water. The water is just around it and that's what it lives in. And similarly, the context and the social political context we live in is just where we are and it's very hard to take that step back from it and see what messages it gives us without us even really realising. We notice as it changes, so for example we start to notice how the acceptance of racism for example has changed since the early 60s and we've started to notice how racism is institutionalised and we've obviously made a little bit of progress with, with sexism as well but both of them are still very rife in our society and it's just hard to spot when you you're living in the bowl of water. One of the things I think you really have to talk about is pornography and the, the messages which young men get about the commodification of women. And there's a very good group in London called Men Against Pornography. It's a very small group, but we support their work. And I think it's a bullet that we have to bite. We have to, men have to start talking to other men about pornography and how we do need to have respectful messages. Well, one of the things that we're, we're absolutely trying to do is to raise awareness of domestic violence amongst men and to encourage men to uh, treat women with greater respect, um, for them to change their attitudes, for them to change their behaviour towards women. Uh, and, and so key to doing that is to reach out to men in places that they congregate and when they're carrying out activities. So um, a lot of men, for example, go to football matches, a lot of men do, do sport. So uh, there's a number of things that we, we've been doing recently to try to get the message um, that we want to get across about domestic violence in, in those sorts of situations. At a Notts County match this year, um, all of the first team players were wearing a T-shirt, which was um, to promote the Man Enough campaign. Um, at half time, there were messages um, about domestic violence going out on the tannoy. Um, Nottingham Forest football players, that they've also been um, very active in speaking out about uh, domestic violence. Um, Carl Froch, the boxer, this was a tricky area, but um, he, he agreed to speak out against domestic violence and um, had his image all over the side of buses. Uh, and off the back of that particular exercise, we got an awful lot of pledges from men um, against domestic violence. There's an attitude amongst designers that needs to change to help move us in a direction that creates more respect and care and value rather than devaluing, degrading, humorising sexual violence and other kinds of violences. When the media stops reporting men who kill women or kill their children as loving and caring dads and actually describe it for how shocking it is, then we might start to see a, a change in society's attitude. 
domestic abuse is so complex, it's really wide, really deep, and it needs that level of um, understanding in order to effectively report on it, in order to effectively um, communicate um, about, uh, about domestic abuse and domestic abuse cases. And unfortunately, I feel that um, the people who are reporting on domestic violence, domestic abuse cases, don't necessarily have the level of understanding about domestic abuse that they need to, ref to be able to report effectively and appropriately. Maybe refer to cases as being either crimes of passion or they, um, in cases where um, there has been historic domestic um, abuse, maybe that hasn't been mentioned in terms of um, their reporting and they focus on the immediate incident which might be that you know it's financial trouble or it was a row that had happened and a, you know, a crime of passion. Alarmingly, we are seeing issues where young people are getting that behaviour at a very early age, whether it be through school or learnt behaviour through parents, about how not to behave you know, to other people. And, and I think that, for me, is one of the most disturbing things, where children think that it's right to shout at other people or whether it's right to assault other people and that's then played out at school and then it's played out as they get older. Claire's Law came in after the death of Claire Wood in, in Greater Manchester where she came in a relationship with a man she met on Facebook. He moved in with her and um, he assaulted her and then he murdered her and her father said and he campaigned along with some senior politicians that we need to bring something in. To, to make people aware that they can ask that question, whereby um, individuals can make a request to find out whether their partner has got a violent history and whether then they need to make some life choice decisions about their circumstances. And I think the beauty of this is, is that people can ask that question when it suits them, not when they're in the middle of a domestic incident or having to make choices when in the heat of the moment. The cost of violence against women is estimated to be £23 billion a year. £23 billion every year in the United Kingdom. And that's the cost of absenteeism, it's the cost of the prosecution, it's the cost of the hospitals, it's the cost of the rehousing, it's the cost of the social workers, and it's also the emotional costs that are handed down, not just within that relationship, but from generation to the children and the next generation as well. 23 billion pounds a year. And if we can do something about that, if we take some of the money that that costs, put it into prevention, it will be a huge benefit to preventing violence in future generations. It's not a modern problem, and I suppose the patriarchal society is not a modern problem either. And and gender and power imbalance, not just in gender, but um, in, in sexuality, for example, or in levels of wealth. There's been oppression and discrimination and prejudice um, throughout uh, humanity's existence, I suppose. But we would hope to work towards certainly more and more equal society. You need change at all the different levels. Um, so you need change at the individual level. You need men. To, to change individual men to stop being violent and to be held accountable. You need the empowerment of women, so you need women to be able to um, stand up together as a, as a group and work together and join together in social action in trying to change government policy around this. And when I heard that I cannot go to school, I just for a second thought that I would never able to become a doctor or I would never able to be who I want to be in future and my life would be just getting married at the age of 13 or 14, not going to school, not becoming who I really can be. So I decided that, that I will speak up. Any form of abuse is totally, totally unacceptable. It needs to be in our education system and it needs to be in every professional agency and every professional needs to adhere to working towards that with no justification or excuse. It's just not acceptable. We want to end gender inequality. And to do this, we need everyone involved. This is the first campaign of its kind at the UN. We want to try and galvanize as many men and boys as possible to be advocates for change. 
And I think it is right that I am paid the same as my male counterparts. I think it is right that women be involved on my behalf in the policies and the decisions that will affect my life. I think it is right that socially I am afforded the same respect as men. But sadly, I can say that there is no one country in the world where all women can expect to receive these rights. No country in the world can yet say that they have achieved gender equality. Just believe everything that they told me While you're looking through your magazine Stop to think of the price they sold it for What they heard, not what they saw Who benefits from the story Boys, I'm not sure what you think But I think it stinks It's very worrying the way the world Just believe everything that they told me While you're looking through your magazine Stop to think at the price they sold it for What they heard, not what they saw Who benefits from the story Boys, I'm not sure what you think But I think it stinks It's February, yeah, in the way the world thinks 